Back in 1968, take your minds back to 1968, the US space program, NASA was facing a major challenge. How do they recruit the most highly creative engineers for their space program? To help them with this task was a certain Dr. George Land. And Dr. George Land devised a series of tests to do just that, to find highly creative engineers to take the space race forward for the US. What he did next was remarkable. He decided to take those tests, modify them, and apply them to 1,600 kids, and check how many of those kids displayed high creativity. The first bunch of kids he took were aged three to five. Who here can tell me what percentage they think of those kids showed high creativity? 92, 100. Okay, those of you who said 100, you are very close, 98%. Almost all of them. What is high creativity? I hear someone ask before I fall off the stage. Creativity has been defined as the ability to look at the same thing that everyone else is looking at, but see something different. And who said that? Anyone know? Nope. It was, a, it was a, the same guy who invented your vitamin C. So if any of you are taking vitamin C in the winter, you can thank Albert Sion Georgi, a Hungarian who fought with the partisans against the Nazis during World War II to defeat the Germans. And he invented vitamin C and came up with that definition. But let's go back to our survey. He then went back some years later and tested the same 1,600 kids at the age of 10. Anyone have any idea what percentage of those kids at the age of 10 showed high creativity? 60? So everyone says it goes down, right? Let's see by how much. Down to 30%. Wow. Wow. And guess what? It doesn't get better. At 15? Very close. We're down to 12. And by the time they became young adults, your age? Three? Who said three? Two? A mere 2%. Okay, that's pretty tragic. That's pretty tragic. So that got me thinking, what on earth happened here? And what we found, what they found, is remarkable. What he found, by the way, if any of you watch TED, strongly recommend this talk by George Land, The Failure of Success. What they found was remarkable. They found that non-creative behavior is learned. You are all born creative individuals. Unfortunately, schools kind of managed to knock that a bit out of us. Um, but hey, no boo, I'm not saying don't quit school, stay at school, say no to drugs, we know all that, but, but non-creative behavior is learned. So that got me thinking, it got me thinking, what does that mean? How often do I take decisions that are predictable, that are non-creative, that aren't really going to get me anywhere interesting? And to turn to an answer, I'd like to turn to someone you may recognize, a former president, Shimon Peres. Okay, this is what he said. Put apart your politics for, a, for one moment. Okay, this guy was the president. He said the following. He said, when you have two alternatives, what you have to do is look for the third one. The third alternative is the one you haven't thought about yet. The one that doesn't yet exist. And the question is, how do we do that? This is one of the major points I want to address with you guys today. These are my parents. I was born in Russia, in Leningrad, to two Jewish Russian engineering parents. I mean, there's nothing totally remarkable. Anyone here with Russian background? Oh, wow. Quite a few of you. Way to go. So, nothing remarkable about that. But what happened was that my father had a dream. His dream was to be the first Jewish cosmonaut, the first Jewish man in the Soviet Union to be in space. A kind of a Russian Yuri Gagarin, if you like. And what he did is apply for the fighter pilot program in the Soviet Union. And guess what? He got through the physicals, very difficult physicals, he got through the mentals, and he was just about to start the fighter pilot training course when he got a call from the commander of the training base and said the following, Comrade Itten, unfortunately there has been a mistake. His accent was a bit better than mine. Unfortunately there has been a mistake, we cannot accept it because you are Jewish. Okay, my mother, my mother was meant to receive the gold medal for a school for academic excellence. But there was a small problem. She was Jewish. And it was unheard of in Russia for a Jewish person to receive the gold medal. She had to be content with the silver medal instead. And my parents had a choice. They had two alternatives. Stay in Russia 
and live a, a fairly reasonably comfortable life with some official anti-Semitism, or fight the system. Fight the system, face jail, face potential labor camps, even worse. My father, to his credit, discovered a third choice. And his third choice was to come to Israel, which we did in the early 70s. Only 50,000 Jews came to Israel compared to over a million uh, that came in the 1990s. And then to, make, to decide how to make life better in Israel, which I don't know if you know, is not always an easy country to, uh, to succeed in, but it definitely challenges you. He decided to create his own third alternative. And that alternative was to leave Israel for a better life in Australia. Yeah. Let's hear it up from the Aussies. Yeah. Okay, so what happened is the following. Oi, guys, we have very short time. Thank you, we have very short time and I do want to get through it all. So to cut a very long story short, I did a fairly typical path. I did my commerce law degree. Nothing creative or original about that. Just, uh, just a hard slog. And at the age of 30, I came to a decision. I had to come to a decision, decision. What do I do with my life? What sort of life do I want to live? How do I make my life interesting in Australia? Because my real dream was to do cinema, was to do performance, to do theater. And I decided to create my own third alternative. And that third alternative was to come back to Israel, which was very ironic, because when I asked my father why he left Israel, he would always say it's to give us, his children, a better future. So both my sister and I came back here, um, and as most Israelis who come back, I headed off to the Lishkat uh, Giyus, the Tel Shomer, the army uh, uh, office where you, uh, where you enlist, and I was told the following. I was told, you are 30 years old. You're a little bit too old for the army, but you have two choices. You can wait for a few months while we work out what to do with you, or you can get a, we'll give you a get out of army free card. So I thought about it for a little bit, and I thought, mm, I don't like those two choices. I'm going to create my own third alternative. So what I did is I created a position in the army that didn't exist. I volunteered in the Golani Brigade, which was my father's combat brigade when he was here, when he was a combat medic uh, in Golani. And I decided to be a DJ, an army DJ. You guys may laugh. Uh, I actually was doing the Jewish radio show in uh, 2SCR, radio, uh, radio Eastern Suburbs, for a while. I thought I can do this here. I was a radio DJ, and I did a whole bunch of parties and dance parties and karaoke during 2002 Defensive Shield operation. If anyone here has seen Apocalypse Now, yeah? yeah? Remember that scene when they're doing a party in the middle of the fighting? It was totally surreal. It was something like that. The soldiers were coming in from the APCs, putting their weapons down and just dancing like crazy. You really had to, to be there to see it. I want to give you a little story about what I do at work. OK, unfortunately not with these guys. But the story is an illustration of my role as innovation evangelist at Amdocs. And it goes like this. Back in the 60s, we're going to visit the 60s quite a lot, there, were, there was a famous experiment done with three monkeys. They took three hungry monkeys, put them in a room, put some bananas from the ceiling, and put a chair they can climb onto. Okay, the monkeys, I forgot to mention, were very hungry monkeys. They haven't fed them for a while. Now, what do you think the monkeys did? What would you do? Climb up the chair to get the bananas. That's what I would do. I like bananas. And what they did is the following. They did just that. But what happened is a small window opened up, and a strong stream of icy cold water came and got them all wet. This is known as collective punishment. Any time a monkey tried to climb up, they were punished. What did the monkeys learn? Don't go for the bananas, right? They took one monkey out, brought in a new monkey. The monkey is hungry. What does he do? Tries to go for the bananas. What do the other monkeys do, do you think? Do they talk to him and explain nicely why he shouldn't go for the bananas? No, they beat him up. Okay, they got quite violent because they were so scared of the punishment. They beat him up. At the end of the experiment, you had three monkeys, which none of them suffered the water punishment, and yet none of them would try and go for the bananas, and if any new monkey arrived, they would beat them up so they wouldn't go for the bananas. By the way, if you want to do some uh, HR resource allocation savings, you can send the guy with the hose home. You don't need him anymore. Okay, the monkeys have learned their lesson. The problem is the guy is no longer there. They can go for the bananas, but they won't do it and they won't let anyone else do it, which is why I say my management courses that I give to our clients, when you have new employees, are you guys, you're, gonna, you're, you're all youth movement leaders, right? I, I'm, I'm correct about that. When you have new people, do the following. Ask them, 
to keep a diary of all the bananas that you are afraid of taking. Ask them to keep a diary for the next few weeks of all the things that you have gotten used to that you're not allowed to do. They will give you amazing information. Interview them, because if you don't do it in the first few weeks, it's going to be too late. Okay, a few words about MDOCs. Anyone here heard of MDOCs? Hands up. A few of you? Okay. MDOCs, biggest high-tech company, Israeli high-tech company. Okay, there are bigger ones, Google, uh, Facebook, Intel, they're all here, as you know. We're not talking about them at the moment. We have offices in, over, in all six continents in over 60 countries, 23,000 employees spread around the world, about 5,000 of them here in Israel. You probably see lots of MDOCs cars driving around. Um, and my role as innovation evangelist in MDOCs is to create a culture of innovation to help the people at MDOCs discover their own third alternative. Okay, it's not, as easily, it's not as easily done as said. The main reason is that, and you will find this in your careers, the managers, especially middle managers, have a philosophy of not invented here. A philosophy of we've tried this before, it doesn't work. Your task, your challenge is not to listen to them. Your challenge is not to listen to the people who tell you those are the only alternatives you have. Or we've done it before and it didn't work. Or you shouldn't go for that. Your challenge is to challenge them. And this is, for the most part, my role in a fairly systematic way, uh, and this is what I do. I had the privilege of working with a number of organizations, some of which I've presented here. Uh, one of the most interesting ones was Talpiot. I don't know if you heard of Talpiot. Uh, it's an army unit where they train them in all aspects of army life. Very, very nice guys and girls in there as well. Uh, if any of you are thinking of army, it's definitely a unit to go for. I work with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to help their uh, ambassadors deal with the challenges. I don't know if you know, but uh, one of the biggest challenges for the Israeli foreign ministry, especially today in the days of BDS, in the days of, of a lot of anti-Israeli uh, uh, delegitimization that's happening around the world, it's how to fight that and how to do it in very small budgets. Almost non-existent budgets. These guys are real heroes. And they get paid peanuts. I have a very good friend in the foreign ministry. It just makes me cry what, uh, what, what they pay them, but they do God's work. They really do amazing work. So. One of the things we did is we said, how would you solve those challenges if we took away all your money? If we took away most of your teams? And what you'll find, people, is that by putting constraints into your challenges, you can come up with the most creative and interesting alternatives to the problem. Uh, as I said, I'm also very lucky that and privileged that I get to teach at the Technion, the uh, MBA, as a guest lecturer in the MBA innovation course, I don't know if you heard of it, in, uh, in Sarona. Uh, very nice people coming along. What we do there is we solve problems. We do that by creating our own third alternatives. We look at what markets, what segments are not being answered for. And finally, I want to end up, because my time is almost done, with a quiz. Okay, now, you are all the heads of an international railway company, let's say in China. And your job is to take a train that runs from point A to point B and reduce the time of the journey. Okay, you have to reduce the time of the journey. What are the suggestions you have? Yes, the most obvious one. The most obvious one, very close, you can't skip. You, you still have to pick up and let people go. So you have to still pick up passengers and let them come off. Wings are good. You guys, the pro, I'll tell you what the problem with you guys is. You're not typical, you're actually very creative. And it makes, makes you a harder audience to ask this question to. So well done, give yourself a hand. So guess what they did? One of the typical answers is increase the speed of the train, right? Make the train go faster. You guys know the formula? Speed equals distance on time. If we want to cut down on time, what do you have to do? Cut back on distance, right? Or increase the speed. These are the two alternatives. The Chinese came up with a different alternative. Can we roll the video? Just make it full screen as well. This is the Chinese solution. The train, ladies and gentlemen, never stops. I can't do it again. You'll have to watch it from here. The train never stops. It picks up a, a carriage and let go of a carriage. It saves up all the stopping and accelerating trips. It kills the two alternatives. We can, we can stop it there. I, I, my, my Mandarin isn't good enough to translate. OK, we have to uh, wrap up. So if I can get, get the presentation back, just give me one minute. So guys, thank you very much. What I want to leave you with is the, the last slide. Just one more, okay, I've got it. Can I control it again? No. 
Lost, if you haven't read Startup Nation, please do so. It's an amazing book. No Camels, run from right here in, in IDC. Great site for comp Israeli companies that found their own third alternative. And Geek Time, also a fantastic site. So my final words to you are the following. Whenever people come to you and say, you have the following options, you have the following alternatives, what I say to you is, don't let them make the rules for you. Make up your own rules, create your own third alternative. Thank you very much.